This is 4.1 angles and angle measurements. Welcome to the beginning of our trigonometry section. First question, what's an angle? And a lot of students have trouble defining this, even though we've been using them for quite a while. But I think it has to do with how other people define them. So let's look at a definition. The first one that comes up from the internet is this from Oxford and pretty famous dictionary, I would say, but look at their definition for angle. The space between two intersecting lines or surfaces at or close to the point where they meet. Now, what do they mean by space? And what is at or close to it have anything to do with it? So I think angles are typically defined very poorly and that's what brings about some confusion. So angles are really, I want you to think about angles as a measurement of rotation. So from a vertex, you're facing one direction. How far do you need to rotate to get to another point or another line? Why does a circle have 360 degrees? Well, there's lots of reasons. Don't believe any of them. There's no good evidence about why a circle has 360 degrees. It's a convenient number, no doubt. But who made it up? We don't know. But someone did. So 360 degrees is arbitrary. It's a, it's a good number. If you were going to cut a circle into different number of segments. How many pieces would you cut it into? So back when they were making metric everything, they decided, hey, a circle should have, or a full rotation should have 400. Because that's, that's more convenient than there's a hundred in each. And you know, the metric system loves its hundreds. And these were called gradients. Uh, they still use them in some places, but they never really caught on. So how many pieces would you cut it into? How many radii fit around the circumference of a circle? So this is fun to do. Get anything that's circular like a cup or garbage can, whatever you have that's round. Measure the radius, and then try to see how many radii fit around the outside. So there's the radius. Take the radius, and we sort of bend it around the circumference here. So this is one radius. And then what we want to do is see how many fit all the way around. So we'll take this, and, and we'll just, oh, that's pretty bad. And we'll just move it around, and then go all the way around this circle. Um, putting in, arranging these radii so that they fit all the way around. And then we can tell how many of them will fit around this circle. I've arranged as many radii as I can fit around this circle. There's the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and the sixth one. And there's a bit more. So just over six radii can fit around the circumference of a circle. Uh, why? No matter how big this circle is, there will be six and a bit more radii that fit around it. Why is that? Well, some of you already remembered that we have a formula for the circumference. It's 2 pi r, which means that 2 pi times the radius is going to equal the circumference, or in other words, two pi radii fit around the circumference of any circle. Keep it as two pi, don't write 6.28 or something like that. Which brings us to a new way to measure angles. We're gonna call them radians, or rads for short. The formal definition, one radian is the measure of the central angle subtended in a circle by an arc equal in length to the radius of the circle. What? Subtended? 
Yeah, well, in other words, a radian measurement tells us how many radii on the circumference of the circle we have rotated. So one radian is how far we need to rotate to fit one radius on the circumference. So when they say subtended, that means sort of enclosed between these two lines. And this would be the central angle that's subtended by this. So our first example here, we have now rotated two radii. And so our angle measurement inside here will be two radians. We want to be able to convert from degrees to radians. Let's start off with some easy ones. 360 degrees into radians. Now 360 is a full rotation and as we just said, a full rotation takes us 2 pi radii to go around. That's 2 pi radians. 180 degrees, well that's half of that, so it's half of 2 pi, which is just pi. So half a circle, pi radians. 90 degrees, well that's half again, so half again. Half again, so half this again. So 45 degrees is pi over 4 radians. We want to leave it like this. Leave the pi as a pi, don't write it as a decimal unless you're in trying to fit it into a numerical response or something. Next one, 60 degrees. Well, if we look at 180, we divide by three, we get 60. So pi divided by three, so pi over three. 180 divided by six is 30, so pi divided by six is pi over six. Then we get to this odd one, 54 degrees, 750 degrees, Ooh, we need a new formula here. So you can set up a ratio like I was kind of doing there using mental math, or you can use this simple equation. Use the degrees times essentially 1, pi over 180 degrees is 1. The degrees unit will cancel and we'll just be left with the radians. So let's try it for this one. 54 degrees times pi over 180 degrees. And this equals 3 over 10 pi. Next we have 750 degrees, so we can set up the same thing here. And we're going to get 25 pi over 6. And improper fractions are great. Let's leave it like that. Now on our TI 83 or 84 graphing calculators, we can do this conversion. When we go to the mode and we put ourselves on radian mode, then all our answers will be in radian. So when we type in 30 degrees and we use second angle to get the degree symbol, now when we type in 30 degrees, it will give our answer as radians. That's 0 0.5235. Now that's a decimal. We may not want a decimal. But I can assume that there's a pi in there. So I'm going to divide out the pi. And then also, I'm going to make my answer a fraction. So it's 1 sixth. And so my radian measurement is pi divided by 6. We want to convert the other way, radians to degrees. And we're just going to do the opposite thing. 2 pi, and we're going to multiply by 1, or a ratio 180 degrees over pi. This time pi is in the bottom because we want to divide it away. We want to cancel out the radian units, and we want to get or keep the degree units. So pi is cancel. 180 divided by 3 is 60, times 2 is 120 degrees. Pi over 12, same deal. 180 degrees over pi, pi is cancel, 180 divided by 12, 15 degrees. One, well, one is just 180 divided by pi, and that is equal to, well, 180 divided by pi. 
<laughs> but if we wanted some decimal approximation, we could write 57.29577951. Yeah, again, it's irrational. Five? Well, same deal. Five times 180 over pi. And I guess that's 900 degrees over pi. And last one, negative 3 pi. Negative 3 pi times 180 degrees over pi. Pi's cancel. We're just left with negative 540 degrees. Now you notice that for these ones here, there's no units. We have the degree symbol to show that it's degrees when we're using that. But there's no units here for radians, and there won't be. So you have to identify in the question that they're talking about an angle, and if it's an angle without a degree symbol, then we assume it's radians. Now the calculator can also do it this way. We just put our calculator in degree mode, and then we'll type in a radian angle, like one, one radian. And then we need to tell the calculator that it's a radian, so we go here to angle and choose the third option to put an R there. That is a calculator notation. Never put that on your paper. When we hit enter, then we'll get our degree measurement of 57 degrees. Angles in standard position start with the initial arm on the positive x-axis, the vertex at the origin, and the other arm will swing counterclockwise. Then what is a negative angle? Well, a negative angle is when we're rotating clockwise. So for example, 400 degrees, we swing this way all the way around, there's 360 and there's 400. Negative 400, go backwards, 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 360, and then 40 more to get to negative 400 degrees. And those would be both angles in standard position. Example four, we want to try drawing these angles in standard position, preferably without converting them to degrees first. Three over two pi, which in other words is one and a half pi's. So our angle starts here in standard position. Remember, this is one pi, so we just need one and a half, so we go all the way down here. Now, that doesn't really show us one and a half pi's until we draw this direction arrow, because then we know which way we've gone. Next one, seven quarters pi. Well, this is four quarters pi. So from here to here. So let's draw our initial arm. And there's, and you can even break it up if it helps. Break it up into quarters. So there's one quarter, two quarter, three quarter, four quarter, five quarters, six quarters, seven quarters. So there's seven quarters pi. Draw a direction arrow so we know which way we've gone. Last one, negative five sixths pi. Now that's just under one pi, so I know I'm going clockwise, but not quite a whole pi. So I'm gonna break this into six, so I can count up one, two, three, four, five, and six. And there's my five sixths right there. I need my direction arrow to show that I've gone backwards to there. Coterminal angles are angles that have the same terminal arm if they're both in standard position. So these angles, 60 degrees and 420 degrees, are coterminal. They both start at the same place and they end at the same place. So they are coterminal. If we didn't have the direction arrow, they would look the same. Example five. We want to find all the co-terminal angles for 135 degrees. That would be this angle right here. And now uh, we could go around an additional time. So 
495 degrees. We could go around again, so 855 degrees, and again, and again, and you get the idea. What if we went backwards, though, back this way instead? About negative 225 degrees. Back again, negative 585 degrees, and so on. Now, how many coterminal angles are there? Infinite. So we, we don't have any way to list them all. And that's why we have general form. General form is used when we want to write many or infinite angles in one statement. So for this one here, you notice that we are adding or subtracting 360 degrees to find another coterminal angle. So we can write that mathematically. So in general form, we have our starting angle, 135 degrees, plus 360 degrees times n, where n is an integer. Now, the textbook does do this a different way. I just like to list all the set of coterminal angles. And so I'm including 135 degrees here. If you don't want to include the 135 degrees, you could just say n does not equal zero. Or our textbook writes it plus or minus 360 degrees n where n is a natural number instead. And natural numbers are just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Doesn't include 0 or negatives. And that's why we need this sign here, so that we can get the negative. Doesn't matter which way you do it. But I'll show you, there's something with the first method here that we can do that we can't do with this method. Example 6, we want to write all the coterminal angles for pi over 2. We realize there's no degree symbol here, and this looks like a radian measurement, and it is. So instead of adding 360 degrees, we're going to add a full rotation in radians, which is 2 pi. So all the coterminal angles for pi over 2 be pi over 2 plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer. Example 7, write all the coterminal angles for 57 degrees, but now we're going to have a domain restriction. So we don't want any less than negative 720 degrees. We don't want any that are greater than 720 degrees or equal to. And we want to write this in general form. So starting with 57 degrees, we can add 360, and we can subtract 360. I made a table to show how I figured out the solutions. So here's our 57 degrees. We can add 360 and get 417. And that fits in our domain restriction. We can add 360 again, we get 777. We need to stop because this exceeds the upper bound. From 57 minus 360 degrees, we get negative 303, 303 degrees, that'll work. Minus 360 degrees again, negative 663 degrees, that will work. Minus 360 degrees again, and then we get negative 1,023 degrees, and that is beyond our lower bound, so we need to stop here. So this one was n equals zero. This is n equals 1, and we need to stop. So our highest n value would be 1 when we write it like this. So 57 degrees plus 360 degrees n times. We could do that once. We could also do that negative once or negative twice. So that's why I wrote here that it was 360n, where n needs to be greater than or equal to negative 2 and less than or equal to 1. And this is not something that you can do with the other method using plus or minus and setting n as a natural number. Because this is lopsided, 
we've got negative 2 here and, and only positive 1 here. Example 8, we want to write all the coterminal angles for 213 degrees that satisfy this domain restriction in general form. So again, we need to add 360, subtract 360 until we get beyond these bounds. I made a table again to show this. Here we've got our 213 degrees. I'm going to add 360 and I get to 573. That's good. Add 360 again, 933. Yeah, that's less than 960, so that's good. Add it one more time and we go over. So we could have n equals 1, we could do it once, or n equals 2, we could do it twice. Let's, let's go to the negative side. Subtracting gives us negative 147 degrees, that's good. Subtracting again, now we've already gone over, so stop here. So that means we could subtract once, or we could add 360 twice. So 213 plus 360n, and n needs to be greater than or equal to negative 1, less than or equal to 2, and I'm saying that it's an integer. So I'm including 213 in my coterminal set. It's coterminal to itself, or it's they're all coterminal to each other. Now the textbook leaves out that number, so if you want you could say n does not equal 0. Example 9, we want to write all the coterminal angles for 7 pi over 6 that satisfy the domain negative 4 pi is less than x and x is less than 7. We want to do this in general form. So first I'm going to take 7 pi over 6 and we'll do the negative side first. So I'm going to subtract 2 pi. Now these don't have a common denominator, so first thing we're going to fix that. So 7 pi over 6 minus 12 pi over 6. Now we can subtract these, so we've got 7 minus 12 is negative 5 pi over 6. Now my lower bound here is negative 4 pi, so this one definitely fits. Let's take this number and subtract it again. So this would be our n equals negative 1. We're doing, we're subtracting once. Negative 5 pi over 6 minus 2 pi again. Just going to skip to the form where we have a common denominator already. And it's negative 17 pi over 6. Now, does that work? Well, now we get a bit more unsure. Let's convert this to something that has a denominator of 6, just so we can see and compare more easily. So negative 4 pi is equal to negative 24 pi over 6. So that's our lowest bound. So negative 17 over 6 does fit in there. If we wanted to do it one more time, this would be n equals negative 2. We're subtracting twice. I wanted to do one more time, negative 17 pi over 6 minus 12 pi over 6. That's going to equal negative 29 pi over 6, and that is too low. We've gone below our lowest bound here, and so this one will not work. We don't want to go any lower. What about the positive side? The positive side would be 7 pi over 6 plus... 2 pi. And 7 pi over 6 plus 12 pi over 6 is 19 pi over 6. Now, I, again, I'm going to have some trouble here comparing it. This is 7 and this is 19 pi over 6. So I can convert either one of these. Let's just convert this one this time. Probably be the easiest. If I get a decimal approximation of this, looks like it's 9.95 and that's too large. So this one will not work. So it looks like our only values here will be going negative. So 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, because we want this in general form, even though there really are only two angles here in addition to 7 pi over 6. So we want 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, and I'm going to say 
negative 2 is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to 0. So I'm including 7 pi over 6. If you don't want to include it, just put negative 1 here instead. So again, I'm including it because I'm just making a set of all coterminal angles. And I'm saying this is an integer. And if you want to do it like the textbook, well, actually it wouldn't work. Arc length is the next thing we need to look at. Arc length is the length of an arc. Yeah, I made that definition of myself. Um, this is an arc and we want the length. And, and that's a pretty interesting question. I mean, usually we're used to measuring straight things, but now we're gonna be measuring arcs. Now we should already know how this works. We know that radian measurement tells us how many radii will fit around the circumference. So that means we have the arc is equal to how many radii. So just from our definition of radians, we should have this equation, no problem. But let's say we wanted to develop the formula. We're going to build off these ratios that must be equal. So this is theta will be how far we have rotated out of a full rotation. Could be more than a full rotation or could be less. Doesn't matter. It's a ratio. And this will be equal to the arc length divided by the circumference. So if we've gone, if we've rotated 10% of a circle, we're gonna have 10% of the circumference. Now, we do know that we have a formula for circumference, it's two pi r. We're gonna cancel out the two pi, and all we have left is theta equals the arc length divided by radius. And if we wanted the arc length, formula, we'd rearrange this and get arc length is theta times radius. Example 10, what is the arc length created by rotating pi over 6 in a circle with radius 60 millimeters? So this is just a simple application of our formula, arc length equals theta times the radius. Our theta is pi over 6 and our radius is 60 millimeters. We're just left with 10 pi millimeters. It doesn't say round to the nearest, so we'll just leave it in exact form. What is the arc length created by a rotation of 130 degrees in a circle with radius of four feet? So we're doing arc length again. And in this question, we're not given the theta in radians. And that's a problem because theta has to be in radians, at least with this equation that we've made. So we can either change the equation, just adjust it, uh, redevelop it using 360 degrees instead of 2 pi, or we can change this into a radian measurement. So that's what I'll do. Theta is equal to 130. 30 degrees times pi over 180, 13 pi over 18 radians. Well, I'll just use that. 13 pi over 18 radians. The radius is four feet. And then we have 26 pi over nine feet. Example 12 we have this sickle and it has three sides. It's got an inner cutting side. It's got an outside here with a larger radius and it's got this short little piece right here. So three sides. The outer edge follows the shape of a circle with radius 16.4 centimeters for 200 degrees. That goes from the tip here all the way outside this red dotted circle to this point here. And the inner cutting edge starts at the same place, but follows a circle with a radius of 14 centimeters for only 190 degrees and stops there. We want to find the perimeter of this blade to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. So first let's do the arc length for the outer blade. And that will be theta 
times the radius. And theta here is, again, not in radians, so we're going to have to convert that. So 200 degrees times pi over 180 degrees times the radius, 16.4. And when I multiply this out, 164 pi over 9. Now, let's do the same thing, the arc length for the inner cutting part of the blade, theta r. This one's only 190 degrees. Convert it, though, to radians, because degrees won't work. Times 14, won't work in our equation here, uh, times 14 centimeters. And when I multiply that out, I get 133 pi over nine. Now I've got the, the third side is given to us, so now I've got the three sides, so I can calculate the perimeter. So perimeter is equal to 164 pi over nine plus 133 pi over nine plus two, which amazingly enough, it's just 33 pi plus two, or that is as a decimal, 105.7 centimeters. This was part of trigonometry one, understanding angles and standard position expressed in degrees and radians. There's some homework, have some fun, see if you know what you're doing.